Professor Phillips' research interests and training cover the areas of macroeconomics, international economics, international finance, economic growth, exchange rate behavior, Asian economics, and statistical analysis of 17th and 18th century Korean censuses. Phillips' most recent publications include two, include two forthcoming articles, Is Schumpterian Creative Destruction a Plausible Source of Endogen Indigenous, Endogenous Real Business Cycle Shocks in the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control with Jeff Reese, and Market Structure and Schumpterian Growth in the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization with Val Lampson, as well as What Effect Does the Size of State-Owned Sector Have on Regional Growth in China, Journal of Asian Economics with Shren Kunronk. Uh, a dynamic general equilibrium model of uh, phased Korean reunification from the Journal of the Korean Economy with Scott Bradford, and a panel data sensitivity analysis of regional growth in China, private enterprises, and China's Economic Development Conference volume with Chen Baizu in Chinese. Now, that's not enough to get you excited for today's lecture. Um, he and his wife, Young Mi, are the parents of four children. We were very, uh, as I said, we were very sad that Professor Phelps was not well enough to deliver the paper, but we're very um, pleased that he'd be willing to take time out of his regular class, uh, hence the reason that we were able to schedule the one o'clock lecture to come and, and present the paper that he uh, would have presented, now in a, a more final form. So please join us in welcoming Professor Kirk Phillips. I note that my, uh, the, the students from my 257 class who got out early so I could give this were also pleased. <laughs> so I don't know what that says about what you're getting into. Uh, this is a paper, uh, as was mentioned, joint with uh, Scott Bradford. We've been working on this project for a couple of years now. Uh, I think I came over here two or three years ago and gave a, a brief little presentation saying this is what we were going to do. And so now we've done it. So this is a report on what we actually did. Uh, I guess just get started. I had a I had a really cool movie here, and uh, that's about all you're going to see of the of the completely irrelevant movie. Uh, but uh, sorry, Mark. Uh, I can tell you what the movie's about. It shows uh, a guy uh, in the German Coast Guard uh, sitting at the desk in this. Uh, radio broadcast comes in and it's in English. You can tell it's from a British ship going, uh, help, help, mayday, mayday, we're sinking, we're sinking, right? And he pauses for a moment, then he pushes the button and he says, uh, what are you sinking about? <laughs> right? And then it says, study English. You know. It's a commercial for an English language program. So there you go, that got rid of the completely irrelevant movie. Um, we keep pushing the wrong direction here. There we go. Uh, to start this off, what I thought I would uh, talk about is something completely unrelated to Korea, so I'm going to talk about South Africa. Uh, bear with me here. There's a reason for doing this. I, I didn't know exactly who the audience was going to be. And what I'd like to talk just briefly to sort of motivate this paper is why it's important to think about economic modeling of political decisions. Okay. Uh, so the case that uh, come, came to mind here was South Africa in the 1980s. Uh, during the 1980s, uh, there was this apartheid regime in South Africa where the blacks and the whites were separated. Uh, whites had voting rights, blacks didn't. Uh, and this was viewed, rightly so, as sort of a reprehensible regime by the rest of the world. So there was a lot of talk, particularly at university campuses at the time, uh, in both the U.S. and Europe that uh, universities should divest themselves of any sort of uh, investment in companies that did business with South Africa, uh, that uh, perhaps there was even talk of trade sanctions that uh, people shouldn't be trading with South Africa uh, as a way to sort of register indignation for this uh, reprehensible regime that was in place. So uh, uh, let, let's this is all over now. We can, I guess, do this dispassionately. What's the result if, suppose this had been successful and we'd uh, significantly divested or pulled capital out of South Africa, or we'd managed to impose trade restrictions, what would the results have been? So I'll make a couple of assumptions here, just for ease of analysis. Uh, fairly uh, inno uh, innocuous assumption would be that blacks in South Africa owned very little capital, but that they did supply most of the labor that was used in the South African economy. That's probably a fair assumption. Uh, white South Africans, on the other hand, would own most of the capital, uh, 
And because they were uh, a very small part of the population, they would also therefore supply very little of the labor that was used in producing goods and services in South Africa. And then the last assumption would be that South Africa was, at least compared to its trading partners, the people that it traded the most with was a, a fairly labor abundant country. Uh, lots of laborers and not as much capital as, say, uh, the, uh, the UK or Europe or the United States, which were the ma major trading partners. So if we go look at some economic theory here, which when I teach this in my uh, economic classes and we start talking about theory, people start nodding off. So some of you may have had the class but not actually remember the theory here. There's a Heckscher-Lean theorem from a fairly standard trade model that says uh, countries tend to export the goods which intensively use the factors they have lots of. So South Africa would tend to be exporting labor-intensive goods and services. Okay? That's a, a prediction from trade theory. Uh, another uh, theorem in trade theory is the Stolper-Samuelson theorem, which says if you get an increase in the price of a good, this is going to have an effect on the prices of the factors that are used to produce that good. So uh, assuming in this simple trade model that you have labor and capital as two distinct factors, uh, then what would happen here is if you increase the price of uh, a good, the price of that intensive factor, the one that it uses a lot, uh, would go up. In fact, it would go up more than the price does. So you get a real increase in the return to that particular factor. And you would get an absolute decrease in the price of the other factor. Okay, so suppose we take these two theorems and apply them to South Africa in this case where we had trade restrictions or divestment. Okay, well, the Heckscher-Lean theorem says we're going to get a lower price in uh, the uh, export goods, which are the labor-intensive goods, if we impose trade restrictions or if we divest. And uh, we're going to raise the price of capital-intensive goods, which are the goods that are imported into the South African economy. Okay. So the return on capital rises and the wages for labor fall as a result of trade restrictions. So think this through what this, what this means, right? Uh, if uh, we believe the economic theory, and we've been very careful to try and set this up so that the assumptions are reasonable, uh, what this says is if you divest or impose trade restrictions, you're actually going to cause wage rates to fall, which is going to have this, uh, uh, an adverse effect on the people you're trying to help, which is the black ma majority in South Africa. And you're actually going to make the, uh, the primary capital owners in the country, which are the whites running the apartheid regime, are actually going to be better off. They should, be lo they should have been lobbying in favor of uh, trade restrictions from the U.S. if the model's true. Now, okay, maybe the model's wrong. Maybe we've made some bad assumptions. The only point I, 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 uh, I'm trying to make bringing this up is that uh, at least ought to give people pause to think about, uh, or should have given people pause in the 1980s. Do we really want to divest from South Africa when the results of some fairly standard economic models predict uh, uh, exactly the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, so now let's talk about Korea. Okay, so uh, for those of you who don't have much of a background in Korea, uh, here's a brief rundown. Uh, it was occupied by Japan at the end of the 19th century. It was formally annexed in 1911 as part of Japan and then liberated uh, in 1945 at the end of World War II uh, on VJ Day, I guess. Um, what this does uh, is we get the Soviets occupying the north part of the country, the U.S. comes in and occupies the south part of the country, and we effectively divide the Korean Peninsula from that point on into two parts. Okay? Uh, we get the Korean War in 1950, but that really doesn't solve anything. It's basically been since, uh, uh, take, pick your date, 45 or 1950, these have been effectively two separate economies. Okay? Uh, North Korea, because of their location, uh, there are lots of uh, mountainous terrain there. There was a lot of hydroelectric facilities built there, at least relative to South Korea. So they had a much better industrial base, uh, whereas South Korea had been primarily an agricultural producing province, and uh, there was not much in the way of uh, industrial development. Okay. Uh, the policies that these two different economies pursue is in the 1960s, uh, South Korea turns towards this export-oriented policy. Uh, they're deliberately trying to mimic uh, the success of the Japanese, uh, so they're pursuing those. Uh, 
whereas North Korea is relying very heavily on, on aid uh, from both China and the Soviet Union uh, and trade. Those are the primary trading partners. In fact, they're producing uh, goods and materials that are useful only uh, as inputs into uh, production in the Soviet Union and, and China, which is going to be a problem. All right, since 1990, with the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, we're probably all aware of this. South Korea has continued to grow very rapidly. GDP per capita levels uh, in South Korea are equivalent to that of uh, European countries, members of the European Union. They're not quite up to uh, you know, northern European standards. They're not up to uh, U.S. GDP levels, but they're really high, uh, especially compared to uh, what they were when Mark Peterson here was a missionary over there, right, back in the, the bad old days. So. Uh, North uh, has, uh, on the other hand, experienced what? He said the uh, during the yeah, that's right. Back, back, uh, back before the Japanese annexation. Uh, North has experienced this dramatic drop in real incomes, particularly uh, huge dro drops in the production of food, and a lot of this has uh, been just bad luck in terms of the weather. But South Korea has the same bad luck in terms of the weather, and it hasn't hit them near as hard. So it's a combination of things. This is one of my uh, favorite photographs to show. This is a telling photograph of uh, Northeast Asia at nighttime. And uh, even if you've never been to Korea and have no idea what the Korean map looks like, you can pick out the demilitarized, the DMZ, fairly easily. All right, and uh, yeah, that's Seoul right there. And. Uh, there's the border with China, and there's the demilitarized zone, and the ocean on either side. So. Pyongyang has a little bit of light there. But I mean, that's just a striking uh, uh, way to put the to illustrate the difference between these two economies. Okay. So the objective of this paper and the, the lecture is what would the economic policy consequences of reunification be and then what uh, economic consequences do these have? So in other words, how would policy change if these, if these two economies reunited and what would that do to the average standard of living of various people in uh, seg both segments of society in North and South Korea? Uh, I should go back here. Uh, this all, actually, this all started. The whole reason this started is Mark Mark Peterson's fault. Actually, he doesn't realize it. Uh, Mark and I have been working and and for, for a long time. I guess not working on a a paper having to do with uh, 17th century Korean censuses. And so, he was teaching uh, several years ago, two or three years ago, this uh, seminar, a senior seminar, where it has a bunch of uh, Korean. Uh, majors come in and do their their capstone experience and so I was sitting in on this class with him because many of them were going to work with the censuses project but he had a, a kid who was studying political science I can't remember his name now a uh, Korean American kid who was studying political science and he came in one day and he said look I've got this paper that I'd written for a class talking about uh, uh, the effects of reunification on wages in South Korea and uh, he made some statements about, you know, uh, South Korean workers should be justifiably worried that uh, their wages are going to be eroded if, if they reunify with North Korea. In fact, most Koreans probably don't want reunification because there are going to be these huge, terrible effects on South Korean wages. And so it got me thinking about this. Well, you know, there's a model there to come up with those predictions. There's some sort of a model. It may not be a formal model. Uh, what type of a model would I write down uh, trying to be a little bit more formal about it, and what would the predictions be? So that's where it came from. So we had to make immediately some assumptions. What happens if North and South Korea do reunify? Now, three or four years ago, this seemed like a hot topic, right? I mean, Madeleine Albright was flying to, to Pyongyang, and, and uh, there was even talk of, uh, I guess that was longer than four or five years ago. Yeah, there was talk of President Clinton, after he, when he was a lame duck president, of, well, maybe he'll fly over or have... Uh, uh, Kim Jong-il fly over the United States for a summit right before he uh, passes the reins on to uh, uh, George W. Bush. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, there was this whole thing about the nuclear enrichment program, and now the, the paper doesn't seem all that relevant. But 
I've already written it, so we're going to talk about it. Okay, so imagine, if you will, that someday North and South Korea reunify. Uh, one of the consequences that we're going to explicitly build into the model is that's going to mean that North Korea is going to open itself up to world trade. North Korea right now is a very isolated economy. Uh, basically, uh, very little trade. What trade they do get is primarily aid. There's a lot of food aid that flows in from international agencies. There's a moderate, small, it's moderate is too big. It's a very small trickle of, of uh, trade across the border with China. Uh, and basically a closed economy. If you were going to point to an example uh, for an international economics class of what does an economy look like that it doesn't trade with the rest of the world, this is the one you would pull out of your hat. Okay, so we're going to relax that assumption. Uh, any sort of a uh, discussion of reunification between North and South Korea has to address the defense issues because, at least for the North, this is a huge portion of GDP that's being uh, of, of the, the labor and capital resources are being funneled into providing defense to man the demilitarized zone. Uh, a lot of the production that occurs in the North Korean economy is produced explicitly by the Army because the Army knows that they can't rely upon the rest of the economy to provide the supplies they need. So the big, huge reductions in defense spending and conscription rates, uh, which are going to have effects on the economy. So you, gotta, you have to model those as well to get reasonable predictions. And then one of the things that we'll assume towards the end here when we talk about this is what happens if you actually allow workers to move freely across the border. That's different than allowing uh, goods to move freely across the border. So we're going to look at uh, a sort of a phased in uh, scenario which may or may not be all that realistic. I mean, as I just said, the, the idea of Korean real unification seems not very realistic right now. Uh, but at least it gives us some sort of benchmarks to say, what if this happened and then we waited a while and something else happened? So we'll walk through that. Okay, so we're going to look at several scenarios. The first one will be the baseline that just, just suppose things continue as they are right now. Uh, this is almost impossible to model, economically speaking. Uh, I'm, I'm working on it with a, with a research assistant right now on trying to do this. Uh, basically, the North Korean is a, uh, economy is a command economy. And so these rational models that we economists write down are useless because we don't have uh, good models of how bureaucrats decide to allocate resources. It's, from our point of view, it's just like at random or something or on a whim. Uh, so the baseline that we're going to use is actually going to be one where uh, we have some sort of reform in North Korea. That is that we have firms and consumers facing something like market prices. And that's a big, big move from the status quo. Okay, so part of the, what we're going to observe immediately is market reforms. And, and we don't have a model of the Korean economy without market reforms because we don't know how to model that very well. Uh, so that's our baseline. And what we're going to look at is given this baseline where the North has at least some sort of rudimentary market system, what happens from that baseline if we then allow reunification and allow these various things to happen, reduce the defense spending, allow for international trade and so forth. Okay, and so we'll look at all of these here, uh, sort of phase these in uh, uh, over time. So let's reduce defense spending. What happens, given you've reduced defense spending, what happens if you sign a free trade agreement and just allow all goods to be exchanged across the border? And then what happens if you have uh, free mobility of, of uh, labor? Labor is the, is the main uh, uh, restriction here uh, between the two economies. Okay, so here's what our model does. I don't even want to talk too much about this. Uh, this is all economics jargon. It's a dynamic general equilibrium model in the spirit of real business cycle models. And unless you've actually worked with these models, that's just, that doesn't mean anything. So all this means is we know what we're doing, okay? Because <laughs> we, can, we can recite all this jargon from other people who've done similar models. Um, those of you who've had at least some... Uh, uh, exposure to international trade models, we're doing this in the spirit of the neoclassical specific factors model. And uh, I'll talk about what exactly that means. But that's a well-established uh, static model that people use to look at economies at a point in time. And what we're doing is simply making this a dynamic model where we can look at how does the economy evolve over time, which is a little bit harder problem, but not that much harder. Okay, so the specifics here, what are we assuming? It's nice to know what you're assuming 
because that gives you some idea of why you might get the results you get. So we're just going to assume there's a single final good. You can use this for consumption or you can use it for capital. The capital could go either into uh, private capital stocks and be used to produce goods and services, or the capital could be used by the government either to build up uh, infrastructure, railroads or whatever, or they could also build up defense infrastructure. So there's different ways the capital could be used. Um, we assume the final good is non-traded. It just makes it easy for us to do the analysis. Uh, the way we want to think of these final goods is it's sort of like the final good that households consume is we go out and we buy, uh, we buy some food and we buy a television and we rent a, a DVD and then we sit in the living room and we eat dinner and watch a TV. That's a good. It's called an entertaining evening. And that's non-tradable. I can't really ship that off to somebody else. Right? So the final goods are things like that. And then we're going to have to buy a whole bunch of intermediate goods in order to produce these final goods. So the final good itself can't be traded, but we may be able to trade all these inputs. So we could go buy foreign DVDs and we could buy foreign meals and buy foreign televisions and assemble those all in our living room if we wanted to. That's just the mechanics of how the model's set up. Um, I'm going the wrong direction again, aren't I? Uh, we are going to have a series of these intermediate goods. Some of these are going to... Uh, uh, be traded and some are non-traded, but they're all going to use three different factors. We're going to have skilled labor, unskilled labor, and we're going to have capital. So what we're looking at, what we're looking to do here is to try and figure out what's happening to skilled wages, what's happening to unskilled wages as we proceed through this unification process. That's the ultimate goal is to see what are those, what happens to wages. Do South Korean wages fall? Do South Korean wages rise? What happens to North Korean wages? Okay. And we've already said that. They could be traded or non-traded, depending upon what the data tell us. Uh, I won't allow time for questions here. So we'll skip that then. We just did some stuff here. It was really cool. <laughs> um, the skilled labor we're going to divide up into eight. We have eight different intermediate goods, which we've identified off of some data that we have from the South Korean economy. Uh, we're going to divide the, we have actually in this data set 57 different uh, sectors of the economy, which we thought was too many. So we're going to combine these based upon some other factors. Uh, do these t tend to be traded goods or non-traded goods? Do they tend to be services or do they tend to be uh, tangible commodities? And we end up with eight different uh, traded, uh, uh, different factors, uh, intermediate goods that are used to produce the final good. And then we're going to look at skilled labor as being specific to a particular good. So workers may know or have very good skills in producing agricultural commodities that they can't take and use to produce automobiles. And we're just going to assume that the, there's just some given endowment within each economy of skilled workers of each of these eight different types and unskilled workers. So we're not looking at, uh, which we could, but it's too complicated, at least for the beginning, we're not looking at how do you become a skilled worker. You just are a skilled worker, and that's the way it is. And we're not going to think about, well, you know, how would you educate people? or how, And that may change the dynamics, but we're trying to keep this as simple as possible to start off with. All right, uh, here's what the government does. The government imposes non-distortionary taxes on households. It also imposes conscription on unskilled laborers. So we tell people you've got to go serve in the Army for some period of time, uh, plus you owe some income that we can use to... Uh, uh, produce infrastructure goods or to produce defense. Okay? And, and that's what I just said. So we can either produce military capital or we can produce infrastructure capital with the stuff we tax. And then they combine these to generate some level of defense. And that's going to be a constraint because the level of defense that's generated has to be high enough that you feel you're defended against those guys on the other side of the DMZ. Okay, so we calibrate the model first of all for South Korea because we got lots of good data for South Korea, and then we try to calibrate it for the North, and it's really hard because there's no really good data for North Korea. It's so, you know, it's sort of hit and miss on what you can get. Uh, time period of the model is a year. This is all just a bunch of parameters which we don't need to talk about here. I probably should have taken that out. Uh, we use what's known as the Global Trade and Analysis Project data set, which has lots and lots of countries, but also has South Korea in 57 in industries, and we break them down into these eight. Uh, 
So there they are, non-traded foods, natural resources. Traded foods, processing, manufacturing, utilities, non-traded services, and traded services. And whether you're a traded or a non-traded good is going to be dependent. We, we actually look at the data and see, you know, do you trade lots of this or not? And we put them into those pigeonholes based upon the observed trade patterns. Um, so if it was above, uh, uh, most of it was really obvious, but there were a couple that were sort of borderline. So the, I think the cutoff was 10%. If you traded more than 10% of your output, it was considered a traded sector. And if it was less than 10%, it was a, a non-traded sector. Um, we're also going to set the amount of skilled labor. The, the GTAP data set here has uh, information on uh, uh, how much money in each, in each industry of these 57 industries was spent on capital, how much was spent on skilled labor, how much was spent on unskilled labor, how much was spent on natural resources, and how much was spent on rent for land. And we take the last two and ignore them because there are lots of sectors where they don't use natural resources and they don't use land, but every one of these sectors uses skilled labor, unskilled labor, and capital. So we just, uh, we're calibrating the model based upon what's observable basically from GTAP. And, and this is just sort of technical stuff here. Uh, the amount of unskilled labor in the South is about three times, at least what the GTAP data sells is roughly three times. It's difficult to figure out because they don't tell you how many workers are, they just simply tell you how much did they pay the workers. And so we know that skilled workers are probably getting higher wages than unskilled workers. We don't know exactly how much higher they are. So this is a ballpark estimate that there's roughly three times as much unskilled labor in South Korea as there is skilled labor. Um, and given the, you know, how bad the data is when we calibrate North Korea, this looks really good. I mean, say that it's a rough number of three is, that's a good calibration. Whereas with North Korea, we're looking like it's between one and ten. You know, uh, we set the prices to match actual percentages exports. We're basically just going to calibrate this model so that when we run it the first time and the market's clear, we get the prices that we actually observe, if that makes sense. Okay, so um, we have to calibrate three uh, key parameters here. Uh, actually, two of them that we're going to worry about in terms of government policy. The little m here is the percent of consumption, the percent of income that is allocated towards the military. And I is the percent of income that's allocated towards uh, infrastructure spending. And uh, we probably have way overestimated I. We've actually gone back and redone these numbers, and they're roughly equivalent. They're both about 2.5% of GDP. Uh, is allocated towards building up defense, uh, buying tanks and airplanes and uniforms and stuff, and about 2.5% that goes towards building highways and telephones and high-speed communications and stuff like that. Uh, the last one is uh, conscription rate here, little f. And uh, labor force is about 22 million people, uh, depending upon whether you count the entire labor force or if you just count the unskilled labor force. Uh, conscriptees in South Korea are generally younger. They're conscripted uh, between the age of, what are the ages? I mean, it's usually between like the age of 17 and 25 or something like that. So they're more likely to be in the unskilled category and not have uh, got any sort of specialized job training or a university education or something like that. Uh, standing Army is about three quarters of a million people. Nobody will tell you how big it is because that's a state secret or something. But it's roughly three quarters of a million people. So we're setting this to about four and a half percent of the labor force gets conscripted in South Korea. Okay, when we do this for the North, data are very sparse is, a, is an understatement. Uh, data are non-existent would also be false, but and probably an underestimate, but it's probably closer than just saying it's sparse. Uh, it's, you know, and a, a lot of the data that are available, you wonder if it was just made up. So uh, we're going to keep a lot of the same values that we do for South Korea. We know that the labor force in, in, in the north is about uh, a little less than half the size of the South Korean uh, labor force, fewer people. Um, we are assume initially that they have the same amount of unskilled versus skilled workers. It's not at all clear. I mean, the first impression we got was, well, workers in North Korea are obviously less skilled on average, but that's not at all clear. 
Um, there are lots of industries where it's pretty apparent that the North Korean workers are actually fairly highly skilled. Uh, it's just they skill them in stuff that uh, nobody values very much. I mean, they can dig tunnels really well, right? But there's not a big, huge demand for tunnel diggers anywhere else in the world. Um, so we're going to set the unskilled labor force at 135. Remember, for, North Korea, or for South Korea, it was 300. And we're going to set... Uh, the, the, the North's skill value at 45 because the South's value for skilled workers was 100. That was a, a, just a benchmark. Okay. Uh, we're going to keep the same technology levels at least across sectors. We make some uh, adjustments for the fact that in some of these sectors we've admitted things like uh, there's a lot more land in South Korea than there is in North Korea, so maybe workers are more productive in South Korea simply because they've got more land to work on. There's more hydroelectric facilities in the north. So we make some minor adjustments like that for omitted factors. Uh, and then we assume that all goods in North Korea are non-traded. And we go out and solve for what do, what, what must the prices look like. We don't know what they look like now because they don't have a pricing mechanism. But what would they look like if they had some sort of a market economy? Uh, military force in Korea is about a million people. Labor force is estimated around 9.2. That gives us a conscription rate of 14.5%. That's 14.5% uh, of the labor force in North Korea is in the military versus 4.5% of the labor force in the military for South Korea. So it's a big, huge difference in terms of uh, conscription rates. Uh, we choose a level of military spending that gives us a defense level that roughly the same as the South. And since the North Korean economy is so small, in order to reach defense parity with the rest with, with South Korea, they have to spend roughly 25 percent of GDP on military expenditures, which is pretty roughly in line with some other estimates of how much uh, how big the military sector is. And then infrastructure is just anybody's guess how big infrastructure really is. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that the infrastructure in North Korea is actually eroding very fast. They're not in, they're not investing in infrastructure anymore. Uh, we had some really rough estimates from the uh, reunification ministry in, in South Korea that gave us uh, length of railroads, uh, the size of the port facilities, which were sort of objective measures of infrastructure. So we pick a, a value for infrastructure spending that gives us a ratio equal to what the reunification ministry reports, which is about 17.5% the size of the South. Okay, so those are our starting values, or that's the calibration. We can't assume that both North and Korea are, North and South Korea have reached some long run growth plateau. All these models that we're working with have uh, uh, an endogenous growth component to them, and even South Korea is growing faster than the world average. So we're going to have to assume they start off at some level below their long run trend. So we calibrate that. Um, I'll skip that. That's not important. I'm running out of time anyway. You want to see the, the, the end result. Um, what we want to do to calibrate GDP here is uh, you know, the estimates, again, from the Unification Ministry give us uh, GDP in the South is 26.8 times higher than the North. And this is a case where North Korea doesn't have a market economy. And we want to uh, calibrate a case, case where they do. So we're just assuming arbitrarily that they get roughly a 50% gain immediately in productivity if they had a market economy. Okay. So that's where we're starting. So here's our scenarios, finally. Okay, the only one that we're interested in for this particular presentation is the last one, where we phase in various reforms. Okay, so we start off with the baseline. Nothing has changed, except we have the North engaged in market reform. This is what things look like in that baseline. Okay, so these are steady state values. When everything finally converges, what do North and South Korea look like? And the important things are the things over there in the final column, the ratio. The first line is the capital stock. Okay, even with market reforms, North, uh, South Korea has eight times, nine times as much capital, nine times as much output. Uh, in per capita terms, uh, four times as much output per capita as the North. Uh, they put about 13 times as much stuff into investment, and they spend uh, about 90% of what the North does in terms of military expenditures. And they're roughly the same level of defense here. 
They're slightly, in the, in the steady state, they've got a slight advantage in terms of the defense. The same interest rate, and V bar there is the, uh, that is the unskilled wage rate. So workers in the South, unskilled workers in the South get about, four, a wage rate that's about four times higher than unskilled workers in North Korea would get. And then, uh, we don't need those, those are prices. These are wages in various sectors of the economy. And the one that really stands out there, well, there's two of them that really stand out. Uh, the other ones are roughly, in, uh, you know, roughly what you'd expect from looking at the unskilled wages. These are skilled wages. Uh, North Korean farmers have a, a, uh, a wage rate that's about 32 times what you'd expect. Uh, or South Korean farmers have a wage rate that's about 32 times higher than the wage rate that you'd expect for North Korean farmers to have. A lot of this has to do with the way the model's calibrated, and the agricultural sector has all sorts of uh, subsidies and taxes, so we don't want to read too much into that one. And d d six there is the wage rate for people in, uh, in the utilities industry. Okay? And uh, that's just what the, what the model spits out for us. And this is what things look like over time. Again, this is the baseline, assuming that there's no reunification at all. Uh, North Korea is the red one. I figured, you know, communist country, we should give them the red line. And so blue is uh, South Korea. And this is the log level of GDP. It's, it's nice to plot these in logs because if the slope stays constant, they're growing at a constant rate. So you can see what's happening here is that the market reforms, uh, which we assume in the baseline here, are going to give very high growth rates, but they quickly, or I don't know, you know, 10 or 12 years out, they've sort of petered out. And they look very similar in terms of their growth path to South Korea. It's just converging towards a, uh, a state where they're relatively poor compared to the South. Uh, let's move on to the reunification part. Okay, so suppose you integrate it. Here's the integration that occurs uh, backwards, in phases. So we assume the following. Suppose North Korea reforms their economy and opens up to trade. They do that for five years. After five years, they're friendly enough with, with the South Koreans that they signed this non-aggression pact or whatever, and they reduced defense expenditures by, to, to half what they were beforehand. So anything we get after five years, any movements we observe in wages, is going to be purely some sort of a peace dividend from the fact that you just don't have to spend this money to defend yourself anymore. And then that lasts for five years. And after that, we assume the adoption of a free trade area for the Korea. But we restrict mobility so that we have all the goods and services moving back and forth across the border, uh, but the workers can't. And it turns out when we tried simulating this the first time, when we allowed for labor mobility, uh, we had 110% uh, of the North Korean economy labor force moving to the south, which we thought was a little bit unrealistic. Uh, even as economists, we could figure out that that was probably not quite right. <laughs> so what we do is we, uh, we uh, arbitrarily, this is sort of an arbitrary uh, uh, sort of attempt to, by economists to model politics, so, you know, may not be very good. But the idea is, look, until the pressure is such that less than 20% 20 20 of the labor force wants to migrate, the two governments aren't going to allow workers to move. So there's some sort of, the economic pressure has to be small enough before they will actually allow labor migration. So, and that turns out to be about 19 years it takes for those, uh, 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 the wage rates to equilibrate, great, equilibrate to the point that the workers, not large numbers of them don't want to move, okay? And then the last one is a fully integrated economy. So this is what it looks like. Here's the, 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 the end. Uh, not much happens for South Korea compared to the baseline. I mean, that looks pretty similar. The only difference is that little blip that occurs when you have a big movement of North Korean workers into the South Korean economy. Uh, and what that does is tend to lower GDP per capita uh, because a lot of what's driving this model is the infrastructure. And when you have lots of workers move in, you have less infrastructure per person and you're less productive. Uh, and you get a corresponding blip the other way with North Korea because all their workers worked out, uh, moved out, so you've got all this infrastructure per person and you're more productive. So that's what's driving that one. Uh, what we were interested in was unskilled wages. That's the time path for unskilled wages. And you can see, I mean, uh, there's that little blip uh, that occurs when you finally uh, have a fully integrated economy, which is a little dip in the unskilled wages, but 
by and large, reunification in these other phases has very little effect on South Korean wages. Uh, those are skilled wages. It's the average of the skilled wages across these eight different industries that we looked at. And again, it looks very similar. There's a, a blip there uh, with that last little mass migration that occurs. The model assumes it occurs all at once. Uh, but again, very little effect. Uh, and you can note here there's like little blips that occur that drive skilled wages down in North Korea when they uh, open up to trade. Uh, but uh, actually, that's, that's, that one is, uh, that's the defense. Uh, that's opening up to, de de to defense. So that's basically because you've flooded the market with labor. You've got all these uh, soldiers that aren't soldiers anymore. That's the user cost of capital, which is sort of like how productive is capital. That's the relative level of, of technology in these two countries over time. And it's just converging until that last little blip is when uh, they're in a fully integrated economy. And then these are the wages in each of these specific factors, uh, if specific industries, and you can see some of these sectors look really different, right, than the average. So the non-traded food sector here, there are big hits that uh, South Korean farmers are gonna take with the free trade area, and then again with a movement towards a fully integrated economy. On the other hand, if you happen to be a uh, a North Korean worker over here working in natural resources, which North Korea has relative uh, abundance of, there's a big boom with the free trade area, and then when you integrate, the, you drop back down again. These tend to be really small sectors in the economy. They're all less than uh, 5% uh, of the economy, and so you get big movements in these prices, whereas the larger sectors like traded foods and processing and over here in manufacturing, it looks a lot more like the average. Okay. So that's uh, it. What's the conclusions? Implied changes in the North Korean economy. Start over. The implied changes in the North Korean economy are very big, but when you look at these in a historical context, they're not that much more dramatic than say what happened in South Korea between uh, you know the year 1960 and the year 2000. That's roughly a 40-year period huge, huge changes in the South Korean economy. This, uh, you know, it doesn't look any more dramatic than that, really. Um, with the possible exception of farmers in South Korea, almost every segment of South, society, uh, South Korean society actually gains from reunification. When we plot those wage rates, uh, they're, they're just unambiguously better off, okay? Uh, and again, the farm sector, we worry a little bit because we don't know if we calibrated it right because it really does have all sorts of market distortions. So there's another completely irrelevant movie, which if you really want to see, uh, you can come over to my office. It's on my hard drive, and I'll show it to you. So that's that. And I didn't leave much time for questions. I'm sorry, but if there are any questions. Regarding the restrictions on labor mobility, can you look at the East German, West German unification, and, and how did they handle that problem? We could. We haven't. That's been one of those things that's on the back burner. If this is a good model, right, which we hope it is, then we ought to be able to calibrate this model to East and West Germany. And when we run through the same scenarios, we ought to predict what actually happened in East and West Germany. So that's a really good check on the model. But we haven't done that. So you don't have any sense whether, whether the Germans did restrict labor mobility or did they just, uh, they just open the... the there, was, there was no, I don't think there was any explicit uh, restriction of German mobility. I have talked to a couple of German economists that have worked on this, and they said, surprisingly, uh, East Germans didn't want to move. That there was a lot less movement by East German workers into the West than they would have predicted ex ante when... Uh, a lot of this may have to do with, uh, there's uh, an explicit and, and implicit subsidies of uh, East Germans by the government. They get uh, wage supports and they get uh, welfare payments and stuff like that. So maybe they just didn't feel like they had to move. Would, another factor would possibly be the fact that East Germany was the wealthiest East Bloc country, wasn't right. it? Right, yeah, so. North Korea is one of, the, one of the poorest of the command economies. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, and the East German economy was, the population in East Germany was, what, a fourth the size of West Germany? Uh, 
So the Korean unification thing is a lot more difficult because there's a bigger gap in incomes and it's a larger population to try and assimilate than, than the, the East German, West German case. But still, you know, if the model's any good, we ought to be able to simulate this model. If it's a reasonable model, and we ought to be able to get, we, we know what the historic experience is for East and West Germany, and the model ought to generate that. If it doesn't, then it's not a very good model. And we ought to do it, but we're lazy. That's because I'm teaching too much. That's what it is. Uh, yes. The information I gain is that uh, after the Koreans watched unification of Germany, they're rather more cautious mm -hmm. about what uh, about the pos problems and possibilities. Yeah, and part of this is this little model that we've built here has absolutely no uh, transfers. There's no transfer payments in here between South Koreans and North Koreans, right? And what I think South Koreans are very reluctant about is like, how much is this going to cost us? All right, so if we have to do something like they did in East Germany and we say, look, we're going to reunify and we've got all these workers in North Korea that don't have any skills and we're going to have, are we going to have to re-educate them? Are we going to have to give them, uh, you know, welfare payments to support them with enough food? Uh, build them adequate housing, what's the bill going to be to do all that stuff? And this model as it's set up right now can't address that because it's just, it doesn't have any of that, those transfers built in. But, you know, I guess the first step is let's do this, can we do this right, and then we can start thinking about adding transfers in. And I think you have to because I think it's almost inevitable that those transfer payments are going to occur. Yeah? I, I, I want to go back to the basic logic. Um, of what's going on here. Uh, you, you started with a story about a student who thought, oh, well, wages are going to fall in South Korea, presumably because there's now more workers who will work for less, and so people will go pay, they'll have to take a wage cut if they want to keep their job or something like that. Right. What is the basic logic? That, why isn't that going to happen? What's the, the, I mean, reduce that to a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the basic logic on this, uh, when you have this free trade area, right, the model that we've built here is one that allows for economic growth. So we want to allow for economies that grow over time. And so you have to have some mechanism that allows growth. And the me mechanism that we've built into this model is that it occurs through infrastructure. And so the higher the infrastructure per worker is, the faster the economy grows. And so what can happen here is if you reunify and you build up the infrastructure faster then the workers come in, then you don't have a drop in the wages. That's fundamentally what's going on. So there's this dynamic between market forces, which would push the wage down, and increases in technology or, or uh, efficiency in production that pushes the wages up. And in most cases, the latter effect is stronger than the former, and so the, wage, the, the real wages don't fall. That's, yeah. yeah. Most Koreans have assumed, though, that uh, wages are going to fall, and most Koreans... Shame they, on them. Yeah. They, uh, should be, they should look at our paper, and then they, would, <laughs> they wouldn't assume that anymore. You've got to get your paper out there for them, and then see if they'll believe it. But, you know, there's a sort of a sea change in, in attitudes, and it, uh, it goes from a 90% consensus on one thing to a 90% consensus on the opposite. And uh, for Koreans for a long time had a close to 100% consensus on the concept that reunification immediately was a primary goal. Mm -hmm. Now the consensus is closer to 90% that reunification is not an immediate goal, and largely because of the effect on the economy and the, the concern for what they, the parallel right. of what they see with Ger Germany. So the, the uh, tendency now is to, for South Koreans to lean toward a gradual economic unification uh, which amounts to South Korean investment in the North, which from a North Korean perspective is really colonization of the North by the South, mm -hmm. economic colonization, which I think would give us all of the worst results of, of all possible alternatives. Your, your proposal is let, it, let the chips fall where they may and they won't, it won't be that bad. Yeah, yeah. But what they're leaning toward but, I mean, is... It's, it's, it's critical of this model here that we've assumed a market economy in the North which is not a trivial assumption. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, the way people are leaning now is not toward a sudden reunification where there would be a market economy in the North, but right. rather a gradual economic adjustment 
<laughs> which in a, in a cynical way turns out to be South Korean colonization of the North economy. Yeah, but maybe that's not too bad. Uh, play that out for me. Well, things are pretty, pretty bleak in North Korea, right? So maybe if you actually had colonists come in and pay decent wages, it wouldn't be a bad thing. I mean, maybe we're pushing this analogy too far. Uh, well, uh, that's what South Korea wants, but North Korea obviously doesn't well, want certainly that North for Korea, obvious reasons. The, the, well, the government yeah. certainly doesn't want that, yeah. right? So they're playing with it. They're talking about these economic zones where they might do a little of this and a little of that. Yeah, and I'm All sure they're looking at the Chinese example, saying, yeah. you know, can we get away with this and still uh, retrain, re, uh, retain the, the restrictions that we like? The can, we, can we contain certain things and still open up in other areas? They have uh, had some moderate par price reforms in the past couple of years, the result of which most people can't afford to buy rice anymore because it's now market priced. But. I've also got the feeling, and can't document this anywhere, that uh, the Japanese and perhaps the Chinese are not too enthused about a unified Korea. No. Your, your uh, perception. Well, I'm an economist, okay? Time. So I would like a reunified Korea because I think it's going to raise, it raises welfare of the people involved. That's a wonderful thing. Now, if I was, uh, you know, a, a Chinese or a Japanese politician, I would be thinking, a reunified Korea with a, with a, uh, that just had a standing army of almost two million people and lots of military equipment. What are they going to do with all that stuff, right? I've even heard uh, uh, maybe they're cynical people, maybe the, maybe they're conspiracy theorists, maybe they're conspiracy theorists who are right, who say that uh, South Koreans secretly sort of want the North Koreans to de to develop the bomb, so that when they reunify, then they've got it, right? Uh, but. There's a, there's a point to this, which is a reunified Korea is a very, all of a sudden a very powerful political force in a region where there's a lot of animosity. And right now, it's sort of like they're both neutralizing each other, right? Uh, so yeah, I, I could see where you would be concerned about it. But you know, as somebody who's sitting safe in Provo, Utah, I'd say, yeah, go for it, reunify it. It's, it's great. I don't have to worry about it. <laughs>